Good morning, everyone. I am so excited to be here to kick things off in London for this year's Bride Lux show. A little bit about me. I live in New York City. I've had a bridal business for the last 20 years, believe it or not. Um, and I have a married, I have two children, a dog. Um, in the last 20 years, things have changed a great deal. Um, when I first started, I could count my competition on one hand. There were no cell phones and there was no social media. But what has not changed is my love and passion for this industry. So I'm so excited to be here and tell you a little bit about my profile and my clients that I service. I wanted to start with a quote that I love. And I love it so much, I put it on the back of my business cards. And the quote is this, elegance doesn't mean being noticed, it means being remembered. And I think in today's day and age, noticed is so temporary, where we all fall to the whole habit of going down the Instagram story spiral, where things are noticed and then they disappear. However, as event planners, we are creating memories that we want to be remembered. It is our legacy. And so for me, this quote always holds true. And I try to remember that in every event that I'm planning. So what am I going to talk about for the next 30 minutes or so about celebrities and CEOs? My approach. Should the approach be different? Well, you'll hear about that. Are there certain nuances when planning for celebrities and CEOs that you need to take into consideration? Is it going to change your logistics and time flow of the events? And given the crowd has seen and done everything, are there unique experiential opportunities when servicing this group? So when James came to me about what our topic would be um, to speak of, he had very few guidelines. The main guideline when that was supposed to be that it had to start with the letter C. And so I sat down with my team and we started brainstorming and we came up with celebrities and CEOs. However, the C words are quite contagious and you'll see that there's when dealing with these two groups of people, they need, you need to be confident, control, candor, concise, cost effective. And as you see from this slide, there's a lot of overlap between these two groups. Candor, concise, confidence, control. Those are just a few of the words that you need to deal, talk to and speak to when you're dealing with these, those words. Um, I'm gonna start with candor. Uh, these people, whether they're CEOs or celebrities, let's face it, they surround themselves with people who tell them what they want to hear. However, you as the professional need to be candid. That's the only way you're going to earn their respect. And if they've hired you, to plan an event, they have to trust you. So control, um, another thing that you need to be thinking of is that they want the control and they're not very comfortable when they're not in control. So you need to be confident to be able to gain their respect. Um, I have a very funny story that one time I was dealing one of my first events with a CEO who was quite notorious in the press for not being that kind to women in, in power roles. And one night I was sitting on the phone with him and his wife and he was questioning every recommendation, every suggestion. And I finally said to him, listen, I'm happy to transition all of what we've done to date over to another planner. And I said, if you're not happy with the work that I'm doing, and he was like, what, what do you mean? Not, I'm happy with what you're doing. And I said, so moving forward, I'm in control and you're going to hear the word no and it's going to be uncomfortable for you but for me to do what you've hired me to do you need to let me do my job and take control of events. So then moving on to um, another area that one would not necessarily think of when it comes to CEOs and celebrities is cost consciousness. Um, with CEOs these people live, breathe and spreadsheets. So it's very important for us to be able to manage the budget and not only manage the budget, but guide them and educate them on what goes into certain costs. Um, update your budget regularly. And the biggest piece of advice I can give you is that they really do not like surprises. Um, another thing with CEOs are optics. 
Um, if they're in the press for laying off hundreds of people, you really don't want to be letting that hit the press that they're spending millions of dollars on events. They don't like it, their shareholders don't like it, so you really need to be abreast of what's going on in the industry that they service because the optics are something that you need to manage. Celebrities, they're cheap. They don't like to pay for anything. Um, they're used to sponsorships paying for everything. So when it comes to their personal events, they're constantly asking you, can we get this for free? Can we get that for free? And I always say, I'll make the ask, but it's not necessarily where I lead. Um, because I do feel like you need to be planning their personal event from a different budget than what they would do professionally. I've also made the habit of, and I stay true to this um, to this day and have always had this practice, regardless of who you are, you need to pay for a service. And it's just human nature that if you don't pay for something, you're really not going to value it. So regardless of who you are, be confident enough, and I'm going to keep going back to those C words because confidence is a big thing that is a thread that goes through all of these things but you need to have them pay for what you're doing for them because they will respect you and value the service that you provide much more. Managing nuances. Are these nuances different? Well, confidentiality is key. It is essential, essential, essential to be building the confidence amongst your client and not only the client themselves, but the team that services them. With celebrities, their teams are extremely protective of who they are and so are CEOs. So some things are extremely important and sensitive to the discretion of what you're planning. Get ready to sign your life away because you will be signing NDAs and you will be then put in the position to manage and have every single vendor sign an NDA as well. Depending on the celebrity or CEO, the level and the extreme of the NDA can vary tremendously. I was doing a wedding in France once where we had to do a background check on every single employee. Um, so again, that not only takes time, it also affects the vendor in terms of what type of employees they can have on that job. We also had to do, you know, they would have to go through metal detectors, give their personal IDs um, before getting into work every morning. So again, that affects how much time they need to get into the job site. And for me, it's always, I need to educate my client that eventually that's going to cost them more money. Because if someone needs to arrive two hours before getting to work because they have to get their ID checked, their phone taken away, it is a time suck for them and they're not doing what they're paid to do. So you're paying for that time. Security and confidentiality. I always say some of the biggest leaks are unintentional. Um, when you're working with any type of client of notoriety, it's super important to educate them that they have to do things through aliases. And yes, they may have their alias when they check into a hotel, but now they're going to be putting contracts in their names. So what I always suggest doing is creating, for them to create a temporary LLC that they then can put all of those contracts in. And so then anytime you're contracting with a vendor or service, it's under this LLC. Um, security. I feel like this is something that I'm constantly managing with security teams, uh, sweeps. And again, the level of security depends on the person that you're representing. So it could be days before that they need to sweep the rooms, weeks before that they're surveilling the area. It all depends. And then you have to worry about who's coming to the event and their security teams. And sometimes I feel like I spend my weeks prior to event doing security walks with various teams of people. So over the course of the years, I try to get them all in the same room and so that we're not multiplying efforts and wasting time and that there are more security guards there than there are guests because it's very off-putting. Um, so I think it's really important that you take control of the security teams. And again, sometimes it's daunting because they're like, I'm with Beyonce's team, I'm with this team, I'm with that team. And you're like, okay, everyone get on the same page, let's get it all together and 
let's talk about what we need to protect and how we're going to protect it. And the more you give them on how, what safety measures you have in place already with the timeline and the check-in process, they start to kind of diminish their demands, demands they have. Um, I always say, when I said about security um, and uh, leaks come from things that are really unintentional. I was doing Serena's wedding, which you'll see Serena Williams' wedding uh, late a couple of years ago, but everyone was on walkie-talkie and everyone calls me Jay-Z. And so Beyonce was coming to the event, and so I was with Serena, taking her around the back way because we had someone else dressed up like Serena going the straight way so that we can come in the back end. And the guards were like, Jay-Z's rounding the corner, Jay-Z's rounding the corner. And everyone's like, well, where is he? I thought he was on tour, he's in uh, Atlanta. And they're like, but he's here, he's here. They said that he's rounding the corner. So again, it's just, the press is going to interpret things the way they want to interpret things. So again, it's just when you have your paperwork, simple things like your paperwork, you can leave it down for a moment and people will see it, take screenshots of it. When Serena's wedding, uh, the Daily Mail had me as her best friend Val. I'm not her best friend Val, but it was like, okay, I'm Val for this weekend, I guess. Uh, privacy and how do you check people in and what levels do you need to check people in again most of the time when you're dealing with crowds for celebrities and CEOs their guests are used to going through some sort of security process um, again no one likes their phone taken away and no one likes to be told to arrive to a parking lot and then moved over to where it's going to be um, we use this device, which is a great company. Um, actually, Dave Chappelle uses this at all of his performances and um, shows where people have to put their cell phone in a pouch. It gets locked, kind of like the lock that you put on clothing. And it could be on vibrate. So they get to actually keep their phone on their person. So if they have emergencies or if they're on call, there, it, again, it diminishes their back up against the wall when they say, you know, can I have your phone? And then if they hear their phone vibrate, they can go back to the docking station, they're put into a certain area where they're held, and then when they go back into the event, they're able to then put their phone back, back in the pouch. And it works really well, it's quick, it's efficient, it's easy, and as I said, it really does help with like that territorialness of ever, as we all are with our phones. So press management, I think we all need to be prepared when we're dealing with celebrities. What is the script? What are the deliverables when it comes to press? Uh, who the vendors are, who needs to be credited, what you're doing with the publicists, who are saying, how do you respond to the media when they approach you once it's hit? With this, wedding, we actually not only had to do regular bride photos and the whole photo list with family and friends, we actually found out we needed to shoot a cover for Brides Magazine that same day. So the day of her wedding, we actually had to schedule in a photo shoot, which as you can imagine, took a lot of time. Not only for her, because she had to be camera ready earlier, but it also meant that the photographers were up all night photo editing and turning around photos that needed to, she got married on a Thursday night, this needed to ship out on Friday morning at 9 a.m. So what that meant for Serena as well is that she needed to get up early the day after her wedding to say what she was approving and what she wasn't. Well, she approved two covers and they ran a split cover um, for Brides Magazine. As some of you may have heard, um, I had the honor of planning a baby shower early this year. It had all the makings of a simple baby shower. It had flowers, cookies, friends, and then this happened. <laughs> the paparazzi. Let me tell you, the British tabloids take paparazzi to a different level, um, especially when it comes to the royals. And they're invasive and obtrusive and rude and everything that we all know. And it could be really, really intense. And your gut reaction is to just say, get out of my face, leave me alone, please. You know, they're making it hard for guests to get in. And she had a lot of 
or people coming in for her bridal shower. So they not only wanted to see her, they wanted to see the guests, they wanted to see every bit of swag that was given out at the baby shower. And what I always tell myself and I tell my teams and everyone, you can't react. You just have to be professional because they are ready for you to put your arms up to just, you have to, have to, have to contain yourself and be professional because not only do you represent yourself, but you represent your client. Your actions reflect your client. And I like to say, regardless of who your client is, what they do for a living, when it's a bride, they're still just a bride and groom with all of the things that normal brides have. Nerves, dysfunctional families, all of that. Angry bridesmaids, one's happy, one's sad, they're not getting married. So really, really, really remember, and that's, I've been, I'm only able to show a certain amount of my clients because of going back to the confidentiality, I've signed my life away on many clients, but one thing that I can say is just remember they're normal, they need your advice, they need you to tell them to calm down, to be their mom, be their therapist. Um, be there for the groom who was a fish out of water at first when he met Serena. It was like, he's a tech geeky guy and here's like all of these people. And, um, you know, so he needed advice as well. And plus she just had a baby. So it was quite, and there is the baby. So, you know, again, there's that family photo moment that we were doing after shooting a cover. The pressure, as we all know, no one likes photos at the wedding and everyone always melts down during the whole photo session so i always try to be very diligent regardless of who it is okay grandma you're in you're out let's go this that so i was doing that with serena and all of her people and i didn't know someone came into the room and i'm just there with my list checking it off go 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 and someone says who are you and i looked at her and it was anna wintour and i said oh i'm the event planner and she was like impressive and that's all she turned away impressive and Serena's publicist was like no one gets impressive you got impressive and I was like I was like being militant like that's impressive to her but it was um, and here they are just walking down the aisle happy as can be Serena is quite the party planner herself. We always joke that when she retires from tennis that she's actually taking on an internship at Jay-Z events. So, um, but we wanted to come up with a creative way for naming her tables. So we actually named all of the tables after four of the major Grand Slams. So the Open, Wimbledon, the French, and the Australian. And Alexis, bless his heart, wanted to get involved. And so he was like, I think it would be great if everyone got a little 3D trophy to say which uh, tournament they're seated at. And so lo and behold, he researched every 3D company and we had 250 little trophies to give out to people. So Serena could have had any headliner, but Serena being Serena, she has friends from early childhood up until today and she's extremely loyal to her friends and her dream was to have new edition because she grew up with her besties from high school that were all there doing the moves singing the songs and as you can see she knew the moves alexis not so much but he got he got there a little but it was so much fun everyone got sneakers to change into the after party a little time lapse. We all know that all so well, all of the different parts that go into creating these events. There we go. I, I'm like, okay, I haven't had enough coffee yet this morning. 
So the next slide, I actually have had the honor of working with Jamie Dimon, who is the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, after getting to know him while planning his daughter's wedding. And I want to go through um, the next couple of slides because there is opportunity to take your social client and they become so invested in you and you become so invested in them and how to parlay that into corporate events. And so coming back to the optics, obviously JP Morgan needs to be sensitive to what's going on in the financial world out there. So we're tasked every year to come up with uh, a simple theme, which I like. Um, so this year, one year we did summer camp and it was Camp JPMC. And it was when it happens in September, so all of the guys were coming back and ladies um, from summer vacation. So we did whole Camp JPMC one year. Jamie is actually creating a new JPMC headquarters, so there was lots of talk in the press about the building that he was taking down and the building that's kind of gonna be his legacy. Um, and it's a landmark building, so there was a lot of press, positive press, about that. So we did a whole construction theme where the waiters wore construction vests. There were all different construction signs. So again, as planning professionals, we know it can be the simplest of materials that really make a big statement. This year, we were at the Hudson Yards, which is a new development in New York City, and it's all about celebrating the arts. So we did a lot of art installation. Those glass spheres actually moved to music. They changed different colors. So they were all, it was all about art installation. And Jamie's wife, going back to making events personal, um, is really into the arts and she's known for all kooky so sort of stuff. So this light fixture, people are like, Judy, did you make that? Because you go to their home and she has all of these different creations that she's made. I'm like, no, no, that one wasn't made by her, but she now wants it in her home. So this is another social client that we actually um, now do their annual holiday party. They are uh, a medical company and within the last four years they've grown from working out of a garage to now having over 1200 employees and the employees range anywhere from admin assistants to spinal surgeons and so the company is very sensitive to segregating the their guests and so they're very opposed to doing seating so as you all know, it gives us a lot of anxiety to have 1,200 people coming in without seating them at all. So I'm like, I can't have it. I can't have it. I'm going to be anxious the entire time. How are they going to find a seat? There's no table cards. There's no escort cards. What are we going to do? And so um, I had the pleasure of working with Todd Fiscus from Dallas. If anyone knows Todd, he's very fun. and. We came up with a color block system. And so we felt that this would at least direct 1,200 people into different zones of the, this massive, massive, massive space in Dallas. And so how we went about doing it is that we had these laser stilt walkers and the simple glow bands of different colors. So when people got in, they said, oh, pick where, which area do you want to sit? in and so at least we gave them all four sides of the room were yellow blue red orange and so they were able to pick an area so when they walked into the ballroom they were directed by color versus by segregating them to here your table one and you must be a vip so it worked well i don't know what i'm doing this year again and they just their last minute, so they just like, oh, we need to do it January 25th. I'm like, finding space for 1,200 people with two months to do it is quite challenging, but we will do it. Other logistics to consider when working with celebrities and CEOs, um, they always wanna create something different. The headliner talk always comes up, and I have a love-hate relationship with headliners. And the reason for that is, Depending on their rider, they need to have access to their stage two days before, three days before, they need their green rooms. And how at someone's wedding specifically, are you going to make that work in the flow and timeline that you need to have? So this was a NASCAR driver's um, wedding and he is sponsored by Mon Monster Drink and they had all of these relationships with headliners, one specifically, Steven Tyler. 
And so Steven Tyler is amazing in performance, but he it's like a concert. And so he needed this huge stage with huge backline. And I also needed to have like a dinner, a wedding, a wedding group that was playing during dinner, speeches. So how do I conceal this massive, massive stage? So we came up with a kabuki curtain um, that actually you can see over here um, that we have the kabuki curtain with some lovely light washes on it. Did people know something was happening? Yes, but at least it wasn't as invasive of a major stage with sound. And then it dropped um, and he performed for, and this is another thing that gives me anxiety, for an hour. I'm like, wait a second, how are you performing for an hour? It's not a concert, like I have to get you into an after party, we're gonna go into overtime, the house is union, the waiters, blah, blah. So again, these nuances that people think are just simple, let's throw in a headliner. It really does affect how we really plan the entire event, the decor around it, the timeline. He's quite good. There was not, no one was sitting for him. This was a beautiful wedding I had the opportunity to do with Preston Bailey in Ravello. And I don't know who's been to Ravello here, but it is a city and town of all, it's a walking town. There's no way every flower, and there were many, thousands, has to be carried in by hand and foot. And so this is the same bride from the medical conference that I told you that we do their holiday party now, was desperate to have Andrea Bocelli, who's so lovely, talented, but blind. And so in regards to getting him, and again with headliners, they want to arrive at a certain time and they need to leave by a certain time. How many meet and greets? It can be only five minutes. So how is I going to be getting him out and in in the time frame that I needed to that still was in the parameters of his contract that didn't cost the client double because if you go over it by a minute, you're paying his fee double. Um, and it was quite beautiful. But this is how we had to get him in and out. Um, so how was I doing that when guests arrived and the noise of the helicopter? And the bride was very upset that he was going to have to leave during cocktails and that her guests were going to see him exiting. I'm like, don't worry about it. It's going to add to the cachet of having him there. And she kept saying, no, no, no. And finally I said to um, a gentleman, Josh from Milan, I don't know if anyone knows him in this room, but he's quite anal retentive. And he's like, she keeps saying no, and I need to get him out by a certain date. And his manager wants a time and I need to get him out. I'm like, okay, I'm proving this. I'll fall on the sword if she gets upset. And sure enough, the helicopter, you know, takes off and all of the guests are clapping. They like made the day. So you always have to start, um, thinking out of the box. Here's John Mayer performing for, um, he opened with a father-daughter dance, and then he played a few songs afterwards. But I always say as planners, we also have to think about what the rest of the programming is for the evening. I then had to take him off of stage and have the wedding band actually come back on and perform. And you can't set them up for failure, you kind of have to set them up for success. And so it's really challenging, and I'm actually not the biggest fan of headliners at weddings during the dinner. Like if you want to have, she actually had Flo Rider in the after party, that's great, they played a track, they have a simple setup, they're in and out. But when you want to put some programming into the actual wedding reception, it's quite challenging to get it to come back to life because you, you either have to end with it or kind of when this bride was determined to have it for the father-daughter dance, we had to do things to really position it in a way that the, the band was gonna be able to come back on and perform. And he is quite lovely, as all the girls on the floor uh, can attend. So creating unique experience, as I said, for a crowd that has and seen it all, done it all, and as we all know in this room, experiential, is the now. Everyone wants a live wall, they want video mapping, they want to see it come to life and they want it 
to be right there for them. It's not just about a band anymore. It's not just about live statues. Can the person come out of the air? An aerialist, an aerialist who serves champagne, an aerialist that I, uh, this aerialist was up so high that I, like, I couldn't even watch the whole performance. I'm like, oh. You know, light boxes, light boxes that you now program to music. And again, as much as these entertainment companies have the wherewithal and the know-how on what they're programming, ultimately it's our job to program it in that it makes sense. Is this light box gonna cause, you know, a bottleneck at the beginning of the upon our entry? So I'm constantly, as these new concepts and new ideas come out, as you all know, it's really challenging for us because there's only A, I would say to people, for a wedding you have maybe an hour of your ceremony, an hour of cocktails, and in the States we do four hours of dinner and dancing. So you have six hours to put a lot of things in, plus need to feed people, you need to do speeches. So as much of all of these ideas, especially for weddings, I think corporate is a bit different, um, but when it comes to weddings, there's only so much programming fit into an actual wedding day. So in summary, um, when working with CEOs and celebrities, be confident, concise, candid in your meetings. Prioritize privacy, confidentiality, and discretion. Manage the press and paparazzi effectively, no matter how hard it's gonna be. And I think the majority of this room is from England. Hats off to you, because your press is a lot harder than ours in the States. And wow your clients with unique experiences. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm Audrey from Audrey Amity's Wedding, a planner based in London. First of all, thank you very much indeed for the talk. Very informative, really enjoyed it. As an ex-corporate lawyer, privacy lawyer, I love the part about it. Oh. My question to you, please, is can you tell us a bit about your background, how you managed to get your first big celebrity CEO wedding? Thank you. Sure. Um, as I... Thank you very much. I, I started in the hotel industry. I have friends here from the hotel industry. Emily Schneider, woo, it's in the house. Um, I always dealt with luxury and that's the area that I felt comfortable in was groomed in. And so with that, New York is a small town. And I think that for me, um, as I said, when I first started, there was Marcy, there was Mindy, but she was on a different coast, and at that time people didn't travel as much as they do now. Um, there was Elizabeth Allen, there was like a handful of people, and then those were the grand doms, and I was like the newbie on the block. And um, from a very early start, I felt very strongly about keeping a low profile, and so it was a, a little bit of a delicate balance in terms of getting your name out there, but then also kind of respecting people's privacy. And um, someone came in, I had a, an office, and someone came into my office. I didn't know who she was. And I just started chatting with her, not, you know, kind of asking her her name and not really putting two and two together. And uh, she turned out to be Jamie Dimon's wife. And um, we're still very, very good friends today. And you know, that was kind of my first start. The bank was going through a lot of transitioning. Um, it was a very tense time in finance. And the bank does a very, very, very in-depth uh, background check on, I always say now, they know everything about me. I'm like, is my ATM gonna go in? Like, they, I don't know, it's all crazy. So that was my first start and I really um, respected their privacy, I respect tremendously how people spend their money. And just because someone can spend something, I don't necessarily feel like that's what they want to spend. And so again, coming back to that educational piece of what things cost and what goes into a cost, we need to educate people because some things they're gonna to wanna to splurge on and some things they're gonna to wanna to rain back on. And so I really respected that, and they saw the level that I respected it. And so I now do everything for them, but that, that opened up the whole world of finance to me um, because they feel like Jamie is such an icon in the industry that if he did it, this one should do it. And I 
never really show any images of their events um, except those couple from the air, and they have no people in them, obviously. Um, but I really do respect that. So in the industry, I'm, I'm known for flying low under the radar. And people are like, why don't you talk about this? Why don't you put a lot on social media? And I truly feel like someone's private moments are not necessarily my PR moment. I don't think 15 minutes of fame is going to make or break my career. Um, and so for me, I've just been extremely loyal to clients and they in turn have been very loyal to me. So that's kind of how I broke in and then the celebrities just start to hear. And again, with every celebrity that sees the same couple of event planners doing celebrity weddings, those are the calls that I get for those who don't want that type of planner. So I hope that answered your question. Jonathan, Andrew from Bloomsbury Films. Um, I'd like to ask a similar question to Audrey, but from a slightly different angle. I really admire your work. Oh, thank you. I really you. admire the fact that you do it in such a, um, a discreet way. What I'm concerned about is if I ran my business in such a discreet way, I might not have a single customer. And I'd like to know if you could, I'm sure many of us would be really interested to understand, how do you go about getting a celebrity client? What, you know, what, you know, what approaches do you have? Um, because obviously if, you, if you're keeping your material quite discreet, and you, you, you've got a reputation, but how do you get Serena Williams as a client? Well, Serena Williams, that was a very funny story because um, I have a friend who's was in publishing and worked for a magazine, a bridal magazine, and she people still pick her brain to this day about who should I use, what should I do, and so we've become friends outside of the industry, but she truly, she understands who I am as a person and my ethos of my company and who I am, and so she's been a great supporter um, in a very gentle way. It's not taking out an ad, it's just word of mouth. and. She had called me, and it was the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York City, and I live on the Upper East Side, and it's like completely blocked off, all the bars are crowded, and I was going away the next day, and she's like, I need you to meet someone. And I'm like, I'm going in for a manicure, pedicure. She's like, no, no, you need to get dressed and come meet me at the mark. And I said, okay, okay. And she, I said, are you gonna tell me who it is? She's like, yes, but go get dressed first. And I'm like, okay, great, thanks, thanks for the insight there. And I went, to go meet Serena. And I really didn't know anything about, I knew I follow her tennis, but I really didn't know who she was marrying or anything. And um, we sat down and Serena is not, she's a girly girl when it comes to her hair and her nails, but everything else, she's not really all that girly. And she had been on a day of bridal meetings, whether it be who's gonna cover the wedding, who's gonna make my dress, and I got her, unbeknownst to me at the time, she was definitely in her first trimester of being pregnant. So the one thing that Darcy gave me, she's like, she's hungry, order her some food. And I'm like, okay, so I'm at the mark and she's like, I want chicken, I want this. So I had it all there ready. And she ate and ate and ate and she loved the french fries so much because I'll go back to the french fries. But um, I just sat there and I said, so can you tell me what your vision is for your wedding? And I knew I was like losing her. She's like, to be honest with you, I have no vision for my wedding. I'm exhausted and I'm so tired about talking about it. I'm like, so, all right, let's not talk about it. What do you like to talk about? And she's like, I love animals. I love my dogs. And I'm like, me too. I love my dog too. And then we did a whole photo swap of dogs and just chatting in general about, you know, life and, that approach, and I was definitely up against, now I know everything, now she tells me everything, but I was up against major competition. And I always say like, what made you pick me? You know, like now we have that relationship. And she said, you were just so chill about it. Like, you didn't care if I didn't want to talk about my wedding. You picked my brain in a nice natural way of what I like to talk about. You brought it back to things that I felt comfortable speaking of at that moment. And her assistant, who was kind of getting all of these calls with event planners on her calendar, was new in her job. And I think we've all been there when we're new in a job and a little bit over our heads. And I felt like Serena's assistant was definitely put in a task um, and a role 
to start interviewing planners and she wasn't even asking the right questions. And I said to her, listen, offline, if you need help, regardless if you hire me or not, pick, pick up the phone and ask me because the things that you're doing, A, are exposing you guys to the press knowing about things. You're looking at spaces that don't make sense. And I said, I don't wanna waste your time, but use me as a resource. And between that and Serena, that's how it happened. And now I do everything for her. So, you know, and she always says to me, I did her fashion show this past September, the September of Fashion Week, and she was too busy with traveling. And she said, just take it from here. Like she put a sketch on the back of a napkin. She's like, this is what I'm envisioning for the fashion show. And I just did it. And I then had to like give the press who they should credit. And of course, my name wasn't on it. And so she said, what is wrong with you? Why don't you put your name ever first? And I'm like, ah, it's not about me. So it's the reason why I stay in her life is because I don't make it about me. Um, and then it becomes a spiral and a trickle down effect. Um, in New York, the financial community speaks to each other. They really do appreciate um, discretion. You know, sometimes celebrities want press, sometimes they don't. So for me, it's about always keeping who's true to myself. Like I'm, I always say, I have to sleep at night with myself. So I run my business very simply with that, just what feels good and what I would expect for people to do for me. So that's it, really. Thank you, thank you.